And this is the last session of the day, just before the keynote. So are you all ready for some hardcore pedagogy? Yeah, come on. That's what I'm talking about. I found my people. <laughs> you bunch of nerds. Yes, you are in the right place. Now we're talking. Um, my name's Andy Colley. Um, I am a, I'm now a director of computing, which sounds posher than it is, at Loris Cheadle Hume High School in Greater Manchester, which is the northwest of the UK. Um, I've been teaching nearly 20 years now. I am pretty much entirely self-taught in computer science. I know the struggle and I know the pain that my learners are going through learning how to code because I have been there not so long ago myself. Um, and that is why I am a huge advocate of the prim methodology of programming. If you've ever been to one of my sessions before, or you've ever watched anything that we put up on YouTube with Replit, or you've used any of my curricula that I've written for Teams for Education, it's all hung around the prim framework. This is predict, run, investigate, modify, and make. Um, I'm going to be mentioning lots of things as we go through this session. They are all linked in a Google Doc that Brittany has access to. So she'll either share the links in the chat or she'll share the whole thing with you at the very end. Um, but one of the things that Simon Sinek, Simon Sinek always says is start with the why. So we're going to do that first for our session. We're going to explore this why because this session is about code tracing and code comprehension, which links beautifully in with what I've seen lots of people talk about today in terms of literacy, in terms of computational thinking, uh, and in terms of that idea that um, the, the idea that learning to program is really, really, really hard. So we're going to start with the why, which is the rationale behind this session and the pedagogy. We're then going to move on to the how and the what, and we're going to do a bit of a live build of um, a code tracing activity in Replit. And I've got some, it's got some for you to have a go at as well. So let's start with the why, shall we? As I mentioned, learning to program is hard. I use this graphic everywhere. And the reason I use it is because I have spent so many hours as that dog. And it reminds me again and again and again and again that novices learn in a very different way to experts. And it's easy as a teacher who is ostensibly an expert in their field to forget that and to, to forget to empathize with how novices learn um, and for me, that's the key to it. The prim framework is about providing a scaffold for new learners and code comprehension is a massive part of that. This is something that Amjad tweeted a couple of years ago. Um, no one gets into coding for the loops and if statements, they do it for superpowers. And I've heard a lot of that today as well. That's brilliant. I love it. That's where I want my students to be. I want them to have superpowers as they leave my lesson. I want them to float out of that classroom in a cloud of computer science joy. But a lot of the time, people who put the time into learning how to program are hobbyists or they're employees. They have a direct here and now, what's in it for me, reason for learning how to program. As teachers, Hopefully we work with some of these hobbyists, but a lot of my learners are here. They have maybe one lesson a week for eight weeks across the school year focused on programming in a large class. Possibly I'm still on a learning curve as well. It's one subject amongst many. They'll be going to maths in a minute or PE in a minute and their goal is far off in the future. They might want to maybe take this as an exam subject later on. They might have to pass an exam in it in one or two years. But one or two years is an eternity for the teenager. So my, my job is to, A, make them love computer science. And B, because I'm a classroom teacher, get them to pass a test in it at some point. Because let's not conflate one with the other. There's these brilliant lofty goals about everybody loving the subject. However, there's also the reality of being in a classroom of the fact that 
they're going to have to pass a test at some point. So what I want to do is make as effective as I can my time in the classroom, as limited as it is with some of these students, with these students, some of whom might not even want to be there. And to do that, to do that, I lose my slide deck. Here we go. I have to think about why learning to code is so hard. And that's where we get into sweller and cognitive load. This idea that you only have so much RAM in your brain and you can only learn so many new concepts at once before your brain, your, your, your working memory gets overloaded and anything else is just wasted. If we look at one simple line of code, this is a basic. It's, if you think about how many different concepts there are in here, we've got the concept of variables. We've got the concept of strings. We have um, an input. Well, what's an input? Casting, because we need to, they've got to input a number and then for it needs to be an integer. What's an integer? Oh, data types. Now, this is one line of code that might be introduced in a very, very basic, very or what we might call a basic programming course. And yet there's so much understanding that has to go into knowing what that code does. So we cannot rush this. We've got to take the time to make sure our students have unpacked these concepts and that they can understand them. And crucially, that I get information from them that convinces me that they have learned what I'm trying to teach them because they're teaching a lesson and there are students learning something and Sometimes those things are very, very, very separate and far apart, regardless of what you think as the students leave your classroom. So here in code, first of all, we've got to understand the problem to be solved. Then we've got to be able to put that into some sort of computational thinking. And this is where my students struggle the most from moving from this is what I want the computer to do to how do I break that down into an algorithm how do I think computationally and then finally there's the syntax of your code code comprehension provides scaffolding to help students understand the problem to be solved and look at examples of um, how to how to solve problems or problems that have already been solved before they move on to writing their own code it's scaffolding, it stabilizes for them in those early novice stages of their learning. And it's all based around this. It's called the notional machine. Just in the chat, just drop in. What do you understand Have you by the notional machine? Have you ever come across it before? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. If you have, what does it mean to you? Let's share some ideas. Just drop what you think in the chat. It was new to me when I first, when I came across it as well. It's, it's sort of like that, Simon, yeah. Conceptual machine. It is certainly to do around concepts. It is students' understanding and conceptual understanding of what code will do when it's executed. Uh, it was Benedict Boulay who, who sort of codified it. Yeah. It's that the idea of what students expect code to do when it runs. Um, because before we learn to write, it's important that we have some understanding of, of reading. And just from that, there's a body of evidence suggests it's similar in computing that code tracing, which is a form of code reading, is effectively a really effective precursor to code writing. And this comes from the NCCE, our subject association, National Center for Computing Education in England. Um, and it's brilliant. What I'm gonna go through now is, is directly from them. Even if you're, if you're not in England, go to their website. There is so much good stuff on there and pedagogy around programming. Um, and all that code tracing is, is this idea of worked examples and backwards fading. We're looking at worked examples here that students interpret and um, try and comprehend here in the predict and run stages of our prim um, to, to help them gain an understanding of how the code works. If you'd like to simplify this, 
code tracing starts, if code tracing happens, I'm a not my code section. Yeah, the concept of a notion machine key to assessing students' understanding. That's exactly what it is, Randy, because for me as a teacher, I need to know they've learned what I'm trying to teach them. If they cannot articulate what the code should do, I know that I need to loop back and I need to teach that again, or I need to um, revisit that in a small group. And it gives me information to act on in my classroom. So here's an example of a code tracing activity. Glad you asked, Randy. Here we go. How do we assess this? Here's an example of a code tracing activity. Some simple code and a couple of simple tasks. Highlight all the expressions, use adult arrows to show the order of execution and follow the program and fill in the variables. So I'm looking for a student to successfully complete these activities to tell me they've understood how this while loop works. And what that leads me to then is how do I do it in Replit. And here is the worked example file in the Replit team I shared with you before. Here's the code. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, not a folder, excuse me. I'm going to add a file in here. I'm going to call it tracing.draw. I'm going to use the draw.draw file type there. And what that gives me is one of these files here. I'm going to go back to my main and I'm going to copy the code like so. Go to my draw and I can paste it in there. Now, at the moment, we are stuck with this one font. I am asking questions of Replit. This is something that I found out about a few months or so ago and I've started to use because I can put it in with my Replit activities. But I'm hopefully they're going to be starting to develop extra bits here. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to get students to trace the flow of execution, maybe using the arrow tools here, like so. Just duplicate them. Like that. Um, I might get them to draw the arrow in like that, and then use the text box tools to annotate. Um, Replit, if you would like to send me a Microsoft Surface so that I can test this out with a stylus, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, but all I'm doing there is adding, using this dead simple draw file to get students to annotate the code. Um, so I might pop that in again. We don't have colors yet either, so I'm just working on there's a couple of things that need ironing out, but it's basically putting an extra layer of code uh, comprehension into your um, into your Replit activities. <laughs> Thanks, Brittany. Is that the colours and the font, or is that the surface? <laughs> um, now, I really, really like this for loops and I like it for selection, and I like it for um, functions and subroutines. Anywhere where there isn't just a straight sequence of code. <laughs> um, anywhere there isn't a straight sequence of code. So um, what I've done for you is a couple of things, because I said I'd do the pedagogy. I said I'd give you a, a very quick demo. You know, I don't want this to take you hours. I don't want it to take me hours. It's a really, really simple way of building in code comprehension tasks into Replit activities you've already got. Um, what I've done for you is I have put in a couple more of those activities. Um, and I've also put in this. Let's go slideshow here so you can see. This again comes from, um, this comes from our Hello World Magazine, free magazine that we get as computing teachers in, in Britain. And it's about, it's the block model for asking questions. So as you're thinking about setting up tasks, you might want to ask questions about understanding the overall structure of the program in text, language elements, like the idea of um, identify the expressions, understand the function of a block of code. So you might want to get them to label up a particular if statement. You might want to get them to underline or to circle all the examples of variable assignments in the code to test their um, their key. Um, now, 
their their understanding of that particular skill now what i'm going to do if i have a second where's my replic team i've got let's talk about cognitive load i've got 87 tabs open here we go i'm going to publish to that team there are three more activities for you one two three one to do with selection one to do with iteration and one to do with subroutines um now i think it was the iteration one if i remember rightly did i already put i've already put you a trace file in there yeah here we go i've put you the code in and if you go left a bit i've put you a trace table in as well these again are a little clunky to draw at the moment um, i just did it with the lines the line tool basically but have a go at these exercise have the, at these um activities or pick them up you've got the block model here and you've got another version of the block model there with some example questions in there that might get you started have a little play with them see if you can set some questions or some tasks that you might want your students to um to attempt based on code tracing code comprehension because what we're trying to do here is this we're trying to get students to read the code interpret the meaning and re record the flow because it means that students are exposed to code that i've written that means that it's not their code it's not their fault if it goes wrong it gives me key information in my classroom about um how about whether they've learned what I'm trying to teach them. Um, it provides the idea that of uh, what I want to say Bjork calls desirable difficulties that I've just heard Mindjoy talking about that idea of hard fun. I don't know if anybody does triathlons or long distance running or anything like that, but we call it type two fun. It's fun, but in a slightly difficult, you've got to love the pain type of way. Um, so, this is what we're trying to get our students to do. The team, if you've not got it, is pinned at the top, but I did want to give you some time in this session to play. I'm quite happy to go back over any ideas or any concepts if you want to drop some questions in the chat. Other than that, you know, you've got some time to play with those activities that I've just given you. So if you've got questions, just drop them in the chat, please. Again, Simon, all this is linked to from the Google Doc that Brittany's pinned at the top of the page. Um, there's loads of extra reading in there as well. Um, but this stuff isn't rocket science. When I've when I've come across it, I've always thought, ah, why haven't that's that's based on what I'm kind of doing before or I've seen other people do before. <laughs> Um, it's really good to see that lots of people are, are trying to implement prim there's a big body of research in there that it really helps your learners with additional learning students with additional learning needs SEND students we call them in england um and that the scaffolding there it helped for me it, i can see my learners building independence and that it supports the novices and it lets the um it lets the experts flourish because I can check that they've understood what I'm trying to teach them. And then I can let them go on to the more independent tasks, the modifies and the makes, uh, whilst I've still got that support in, um, in at the, the beginner end. I think it's a brilliant framework. It's the best one I've come across. I've heard similar stuff referred to across lots of sessions and some people are calling it coaching and independent learning. And I see myself as a quite a traditional teacher, but this for me allows me to provide that scaffolding and then open it up to get my students um, creating and making. For me though, you can only do that once you've got the foundations and you've got the basics. I'm gonna bob over to my team. Liz has a question about, do you know anyone who has used it for other CS areas? Okay, so other CS areas, Liz. Could you could you clear that one up for me in terms of apart from programming? SQL. Um, 
are you after some resources, Liz? Or are you, um, are you just thinking about how you could apply it? Because I've not seen it applied to SQL. I've not seen it applied to SQL. I think that would be brilliant on the, um, the team's curricula. There's a great SQL curriculum on there already that I think could be quite readily adapted. Um, for me, SQL up to, yeah, for me, SQL up to, I don't know, we call it GCSE, the, the exams at the age of 16 is quite straightforward. Um, I think it, it's, it's pretty much selection with conditions. So I think it would build nicely into that. And again, code tracing like that works with it works with selection because you've got different branches really but yeah I, I can definitely see that i mean in terms of predict and run predicting is what search results will will this sql bring back you know modify so this search so that it it brings back all the um people who earn more than twenty thousand pounds a year Things like that. Absolutely. I think it fits really nicely. It'd be great to see what you come up with. I'm very, very conscious that I wanted to finish before or on time because you don't want to impinge on the um, the keynote speaker, do you? Thank you all very much for coming, folks. Enjoy the rest of the sessions or the rest of the keynote. I'll, uh, if you've got any questions, ping me back through Replit or it's Mr. A. Collie on Twitter. I'm always on there, so you can always get